Hi, uh, I'm Mike Mikowski, and I'm uh, your moderator for the Iwani Conference uh, session, Hezbollah and Iran's Axis of Resistance. The title of the panel highlights the vital importance that Hezbollah's role, uh, uh, of Hezbollah's role to Iran in the region and around the world. Certainly, as many know, for many decades, Iran, Hezbollah has increased its power in Lebanon, maintains a rocket and missile arsenal of over 130,000 aimed at Israel, growing precision guided uh, missiles, uh, which is intended as uh, my colleague, General Yaakov Amidjork has called a few years ago, a uh, ring of fire against Israel to uh, increase its, uh, at a minimum to increase its leverage against Israel and also to, uh, to, to, to utilize, to execute uh, as need be. Uh, certainly to preclude, to prevent or minimize the chances of an Israeli strike against Iran in, in uh, nuclear facilities. It's also, uh, as Bola's used uh, for other objectives against other enemies such as Saudi, uh, of Iran, such as Saudi Arabia. As Bola serves as a major instrument of, uh, of the IRGC, Al-Quds forces, the Iranian uh, forces that are active abroad, it's a Shia Arab and Arabic speaking force that works on behalf of Iran in the Arab world to extend its uh, Iranian influence. It's active in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Gaza, and of course, and perhaps a little less, even further less known around the world, in Europe, in the United States, in Asia, South America, <clears throat> and elsewhere. So we're gonna be talking about all that. Uh, and uh, before I introduce the panel, I'll just add, if you uh, have any questions, you should go in the ask question tab in the, in the Zoom and, uh, and ask, and uh, I'll do my best to, I'll be seeing those questions and I'll uh, do my best to ask the, the panelists uh, a, a little later in the session. So please ask and write down as you're thinking of them. Now, let me start with the, introducing a really interesting panel. Uh, first is David Daoud. Uh, he's, a, he's a research analyst at United Against a Nuclear Iran, uh, and, the Atlanta, and he's also an Atlantic Council non-resident fellow. He previously worked as a staff member on Capitol Hill, and he has a JD from Suffolk's Uni Suffolk University. Dr. Matt Levitt is a Fromer Wexler Fellow and Director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy Stein Program on Counterterrorism and Intelligence. Previously, he served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Intelligence and Analysis at the U.S. Department of Treasury. Uh, Matt is a, is a PhD from Tufts School of uh, Law and Diplomacy. Uh, Mitch Silber is the Adjunct uh, Associate Professor of International and Public Affairs and the Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. He previously served as Director of Intelligence Analysis at the New York City Police Department. He has an MA in International Relations from Columbia University. Alexander Ritzman, Associate Fellow at the German Council of Foreign Relations and advisor to the uh, Counter Extremism Project in Berlin. Previously, he served as a member of the Berlin State Parliament. And I'm, as I, as I said, Michael Mikowski. I'm President CEO of Jins, uh, Jewish Institute for National Security of America, JINSA. I previously served in the Office of Secretary of Defense. And my last degree is a, have a PhD in diplomatic history from Harvard. Uh, so let's start with our first questions. Um, again, as you see, we really have an excellent panel given often uh, with expertise from really different angles on this really interesting issue that probably doesn't get enough discussed, certainly in the media and, uh, and elsewhere. Let me, let's start first with Lebanon, because that's kind of Hezbollah's base. And then we'll kind of build out in concentric circles to the region, uh, Europe, and the United States. So in Lebanon, as we said, Hezbollah uh, is not, maybe not just a state within a state, but it seems effectively a state in Lebanon. And increasingly, Lebanon seems a, a failed state with economic ruin. I'd like to start with David uh, and ask him first to briefly discuss Hezbollah's position in Lebanon uh, how, if it's been strengthening, if it's been weakening, uh, despite the economic uh, challenges in the country, among other issues. And if he could also, I'd like David to address 
uh, Hezbollah's relationship uh, with the Lebanese armed forces. Okay, thanks. Please, David. Uh, thank you for having me. So uh, this is uh, kind of a complicated topic, and we can delve into it more as we go through the discussion. But I think in short, uh, right, when, when the October uh, 17th, 2019 protests happened, uh, two million Lebanese went out into the streets, and there was kind of an impression that was, this was Cedar Revolution 2.0. It wasn't, right? This was a movement of people from across sectarian lines, across geographic locations in Lebanon, and also across political lines. There was no unity on uh, the question of disarming Hezbollah. If you looked at different, uh, different groups of protesters from different geographic locations, there was no consensus on this. Um, in fact, if uh, an AUB, uh, Isam Fetis Institute poll that was conducted in, um, or study that was conducted in November 2019, listing the 22 uh, or so main uh, demands of the protesters didn't list weapons of Hezbollah or disarming Hezbollah um, on there at all. Right? Rule of law was fourth from last, if we want to consider that, uh, uh, you know, to, to include uh, disarming Hezbollah. So what Hezbollah has done in the meantime, it has navigated the crisis, right? It has attempted, obviously, uh, if, you, if you have a, a large crisis that is siphoning away people, siphoning away supporters uh, from the major political groups, Hezbollah is not necessarily immune. It is part of the corrupt political system. And I think that is obvious to most people, or at least it was to the protesters. Hezbollah took a multi-pronged approach uh, to, to kind of navigate the crisis, right? Part of it was propaganda and intimidation. Um, we saw this against the protesters, uh, you know, to, to pull kind of its supporters out of the protest movement, lest they be swept up uh, in it uh, and turn against the group, right? This, there was the propaganda that these protesters were on the payroll of foreign embassies and so on and so forth. Um, the other part of the propaganda campaign was that, no, no, it's not Hezbollah and the Lebanese political institution that is primarily, or the political class that is primarily responsible for Lebanon's uh, current uh, economic predicament. It is the United States. It is an American siege. Every bit of suffering that the Lebanese are going through should not be attributed to the bad policies primarily of the 1990s, but through an American siege. Um, the third part of what they did was that they put out uh, self-serving, but ultimately policy proposals purporting to, to counter or break this alleged American siege. Part of it was turning east, right, reopening trade with Syria, turning to Iran, China uh, was, another, was, another, was another actor. Um, another pro proposal they had was to buy fuel from Iran with liras. Um, and the fourth part was um, to engage in concrete actions, but with heavy PR value. Uh, most recently, we have the importation of fuel uh, from Iran. Right? Did this solve Lebanon's fuel crisis? No, but it, it, at least Hezbollah looks like it's acting. And Hezbollah has subsisted, uh, in fact, on small actions. Uh, by magnifying their propaganda value. Right? We should not dismiss something like this. Another thing that they did uh, was distribute uh, bread freely in, in, in squares, right? There was one uh, picture that I remember uh, where they put bread, uh, loaves of bread or wrap, you know, big bags of bread uh, where people couldn't afford bread uh, with pictures, you know, no one, no one will starve uh, during the era of Hassan Nasrallah. Um, so when, when they're offering concrete proposals, concrete actions, uh, they're distributing food, uh, uh, COVID response, right? when they, they seem to be acting, um, it, it allows them to retain their base at the very least or, or, or stem the whatever defection that the, uh, the protest movement or, the, or the, the, the past two years of economic collapse could have caused. So perhaps Hezbollah isn't strengthened. Um, it's definitely not weakened to the point where we can start to clock down to its demise. Uh, but the Lebanese economic collapse has constrained Hezbollah's actions. And that's a distinction to be made between it being weakened and it being constrained. If I could just, let me follow up with you. And then I'm sure Matt might or others might want to join in. But let me just ask you, David, on that. I mean, there was recently gunfire mm -hmm. between uh, uh, Hezbollah <laughs> and uh, Hezbollah allied forces and others in Lebanon uh, mm -hmm. during a rally. And I, I was kind of struck by that where they were being shot at. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could address how you see still our other groups, given the uh, uh, frustration with the economic, political and other elements of the situation in Lebanon, do you see other, some forces coming together against Hezbollah at all? Um, no, I, I see these as, as isolated incidents, right? We had, I think it was in August 2021, there was an incident in Khaldeh, 
uh, where a funeral, uh, pro Hezbollah funeral was shot on. Uh, I think three people were killed. Uh, there was the incident in um, August when the, uh, the the truck had launched uh, the truck that had launched rockets in northern Israel was returning through a Druze village, and some of the villagers had interdicted the truck and tried to you know uh, uh, to, to attack the the rocket launchers, uh, the individuals launching the rockets. And then there was this most recent incident. I mean, these seem to me um, isolated incidents. I think it's a mistake um, to draw uh, a connection out of the, between them to say that Lebanon's various political forces, either the traditional forces or the opposition, or the genuine opposition, if we can refer to it as that, that you saw in the protest and ar- arraying against Hezbollah. And even if they were, um, Hezbollah uh, is more than a match for, for this, right? It, you know, Nasrallah recently, after the, the, the Tayuna incident that you're referring to, um, gave a very threatening speech uh, directed mainly at Lebanon's Christian population and at the Lebanese Forces Party claiming that he had 100,000 uh, fighters ready to go. Now, this is clearly an exaggeration, but at the same time, one has to look at two things. What are the forces that those opposing Hezbollah have? And can they draw on the same support that Hezbollah has drawn on, say, in Syria, right? This array of Shia militias uh, that they were able to bring to bear along with Iran to ensure what we can now say is Assad's victory. Um, and can they draw on the armed expertise, the armed, you know, the, 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 their armaments or, or their, their proficiency in fighting? And I think the question is decidedly no. Uh, so whatever we see here, I think these are gasps, but they're not, uh, they should not be seen as kind of a concerted effort against Hezbollah. I just want to ask a follow-up on, on Lebanon. Matt, uh, if you could address how you see Hezbollah's relations with other independent uh, or, well, excuse me, other, not independent, other armed elements in uh, in Lebanon, such as the Lebanese armed forces. So thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure to be able to participate in this Yoni conference and uh, especially to be on a panel with these panelists. Um, I think Hezbollah is in a little bit of a pickle. Dode is right. Um, it's able to navigate all of this but the political challenges and economic challenges in Lebanon affect it as well. It is part and parcel of the mafia style corrupt political class. It is also the de facto enforcers of that system by virtue of being the only ones that have maintained their arms since the five thirds. Um, and so this is not going to be their uh, end goal, but it does put them in a difficult position and it makes the Israelis, for example, concerned that at some point Hezbollah may feel the need to try and draw Israel into some conflict to distract everybody from Hezbollah's role uh, in Lebanon. Hezbollah has people within the LAF that that support it, and the LAF overall is also a counterbalance to it. The bigger question to me is the relations that Hezbollah has built in the region with other Shia militias that make Hezbollah's uh, presence much more powerful. You now have, as a result of the war in Syria, Iraq too, but especially Syria, the creation of effectively an Iranian foreign legion where Hezbollah as the premier under Paris, first among equals among uh, Iran's proxies, together with the Quds Force having trained up other Shia militia groups in Lebanon, others other, in Syria that is, other people from Lebanon, from Iraq, but also from Afghanistan, from Pakistan and elsewhere. And you now have a much larger set of actors that can sometimes be deployed in tandem. So if someone threatens Iran or its nuclear program, maybe Hezbollah threatens to attack from Lebanon, or now Hezbollah operatives are setting up capabilities in Syria along the Golan Heights, or maybe Houthi uh, rebels in Yemen uh, decide they want to shoot rockets at southern Israel, which they have the capability to do. Israelis have struck at rocket capabilities of Iraqi Shia militants in western Iraq because of their capabilities. And so you have a much more integrated uh, radical Shia network than just Hezbollah. And they're not all the same and they're not all equals. Hezbollah is much closer to Iran than say the Houthis are, but they are interconnected and they are networked. And Hezbollah does have relationships with each of these and it makes things much more dangerous and complicated. I'm glad it's a good segue because I want to talk about the region and you just touched on. Let me drill down on some of what you just said, Matt, a little bit. First of all, let me let me start with Syria because uh, obviously that civil war has been going on for 10 years um, uh, about the, I'd like to address 
Hezbollah's role in that role, uh, because Syria is so important to Iran, and we'll get to Iraq after that, but how many like Hezbollah forces have been killed or, or maimed in, in that war? What role have they played in helping maintain Assad's uh, uh, power? And have they have uh, have they gained have, have have their have they gained uh, knowledge and expertise in fighting that has maybe offset some of their losses? I kind of wonder if you would address just generally uh, their role in the uh, Syrian civil war. Thanks. Hezbollah's role in Syria cannot be um, underestimated. Uh, they proved to be the critical fighting force in turning the tide of the war in Kalamun along the Lebanese border. And then, as I mentioned, in close cooperation with Rums Quds Force, training up, overseeing uh, the fighting capabilities of these other Shia fighters from Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and elsewhere. On the one hand, Hezbollah suffered significant losses, far more losses and people killed and wounded in this war than in all of the wars and conflicts and battles with Israel combined. Some say about 10,000 people have been deployed uh, from Hezbollah at one time or another to uh, Syria, many of them in multiple deployments. And there are some estimates that as many as 2,000 people have been killed and 6,000 or more wounded. Now, despite that setback, they've also built skills. They've, they've learned new fighting techniques. I think much more importantly, they have developed these relationships. You know, those, those bonds that are formed uh, in the trenches uh, when bullets are flying at you are very strong. And I think that the Quds Force, Lebanese, Hezbollah, Iraqi uh, Shia militias, and the others, those relationships are very strong. And in fact, we're already seeing cases of Iran or Hezbollah plots around the world, which we'll get to later, which are involving non-Iranians, non-Lebanese, but other people of other nationalities from these various Shia uh, militant groups. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, I'm going to immediately bring in a question that someone's already asked, which I think is very pertinent to what we've discussed so far is what has been the impact of the Soleimani killing of January 2020, um, uh, you know, conducted uh, by the United States under President Trump? What has been the impact of that killing uh, on Hezbollah's role? Has it now, as we say, Soleimani was uh, head of the um, uh, Al Quds Force, uh, basically is uh, an Iranian um, uh, the force that uh, works abroad and uh, uh, creating a lot of mischief in other countries. Um, in a way, has has Bola's role increased uh, uh, t for the Iranians, or uh, or been diminished by this uh, Soleimani assassination? Anyone want to join in on that? All right, Matt, you want to, I'll volunteer you. <laughs> sure. Uh, look, um, the assassination custom Suleimani removed a very, very critical personality uh, from the mix. And there's been no one who's been able to step in and take, fill his shoes. Uh, Hezbollah operatives, senior Hezbollah operatives have been called upon to kind of play a mediating role among some of the Iraqi Shia militants, um, uh, Kautharani in Iraq, even Nasrallah himself. Um, and that has kind of forced Hezbollah to play kind of an office manager role within this larger um, uh, group of Shia militants that work together uh, at Iran's behest. It hasn't been so smooth. Uh, Hezbollah, Lebanese Hezbollah would prefer not to kind of take over this overall role. But Nasrallah is the closest Iran has to someone who has that kind of charismatic personality, uh, and so he's done it in, in the moment. Uh, overall, the, the lack of Qasem Soleimani has really set back these groups significantly. I know this was a very controversial action, but it, it ended up being operationally pretty effective. Yeah. But uh, did that mean that the IR, uh, the Al Quds forces impact was relative has been relatively less and as Bola's role has been uh, relatively more since then or not necessarily? Too simple a statement to put it that way. The Quds Force is just as aggressive as it's been and some might even say more so because people are jockeying for position and trying to prove themselves within an organization that's in flux. Uh, but um, 
uh, Ismail Khani, the, the, the head is more of an Afghanistan hand than uh, an Arab world hand. Uh, his deputy who was brought in from Lebanon where he had been overseeing Quds Force operations in Lebanon has since died. I, I think that the Quds Force is still very active and operational, but as lacking someone who can unify all of these different groups, you see the Iraqi groups really arguing amongst each other uh, in particular, that has, that has set them back. And in general, I think it's been a big setback for all of these groups together in terms of their ability to coalesce and, and cooperate. Um, I'm gonna come back to the region. I wanna make sure we get the other panelists involved. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll go global and we could go back and forth uh, global and regional. Uh, I wanna turn uh, to Europe for a second before we get to the United States. Um, look, um, as we said at the outset, as Bola's role has been, um, um, it's it's not just the region. It's it, 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 its arms are everywhere around the world. I'd like to turn to Europe and and and, and have Alexander uh, address this question uh, first, and others could jump in. Um, look, just to use an example. It, the U.S. is accused as bull of having. Um, explosive chemicals in European ports. Uh, there have been attacks uh, on, uh, but what is that? There have been attacks, of course, that have been attributed to Iranian intelligence, but what is Hezbollah's role in Europe? Uh, what, do, what do you see? What did they try to achieve for the Iranians? Uh, and then start with that, and then we'll talk about what, what's been done to confront that. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I would say maybe if, if Hezbollah is in the region, in the Middle East, something like an aircraft carrier of the Iranian regime at the border of Israel, then maybe Germany and some European countries serve as forward operation bases, um, mostly for logistical and financial purposes. So for decades, there have been intelligence reports clearly indicating that there is a presence of Hezbollah supporters several associations and mosques that are affiliated with the Iranian regime, or especially directly with Hezbollah, have been highlighted. There's been an ongoing discussion and effort of what to do about it. And the, the assessment of the political leadership and the intelligence was Europe and Germany serve as a retreat space. Uh, it's a, a space to, to network. It's a space to, to collect money. But also, if there would be a specific conflict in the region in the Middle East, of course, this network and sleeper cells could be activated to then attack American, Jewish, Israeli, or other targets. So there was an assessment that there's capacity, but that the capacity is being held back until needed. And just maybe as a, as a bridge point, Germany outlawed, banned Hezbollah activities in Germany just last year. So for decades, they were operating to a degree uh, for specific reasons, which we can dive into later, I guess. Yeah, Mike, if I could add on to that. Yeah, I was going to um, ask you the next question on that. Go ahead, please. Sure. I mean, uh, you know, taking Alexander's metaphor with these forward operating bases, uh, you know, one of the things that you want to have in a forward operating base is sort of the ability to do advanced logistical planning. And in fact, uh, both in Cyprus and in the UK, we've had exactly that. Um, a few years back in Cyprus, uh, Hezbollah was able to stockpile the supply of first aid ice packs that had more than eight metric tons of ammonium nitrate. And if you're thinking about ammonium nitrate, that should remind you of the explosion at the uh, port in, uh, in Lebanon. Uh, probably not coincidental. And this was found in the home of a 26-year-old dual Lebanese citizen who admitted to being a member of Hezbollah. Uh, and not long afterward, in the UK, three metric tons of ammonium nitrate discovered by MI5 and the Met Police, again, also in these sort of first aid packages but uh, this amount, amount of ammonium nitrate was more than was used in the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing that we know killed 168 people in the US. So, you know, again, Hezbollah stockpiling material in various parts of Europe so that they've got that latent capability should, as Alexander mentioned, you know, there be some type of conflict, they can, you know, utilize those resources that they've stockpiled. Yeah. 
let me get back to the United States with you, Mitch, but, but before so, David, could you just address, uh, since uh, uh, Mitch brought up ammonium nitrate, could you explain why that uh, is, is so important and discuss that explosion at the port that he's referring to? Right. So August 4th, 2020, you know, the, a portion of 20, 2,750 tons of ammonium nitrate uh, exploded at Beirut port. Now, if we're being honest and fair, uh, there has been nothing that conclusively ties that ammonium nitrate to Hezbollah. Um, they have used ammonium nitrate in their attacks, but it also has, uh, you know, fertilizer purposes, different types of purposes. Were they or should they have been aware of it? And did they not warn of it as a different issue? Right. Uh, you know, they, they themselves have a strong presence at the port. Um, and their allies uh, at different points were the Lebanese officials in charge of the in charge of the in charge of the port. They did nothing uh, to warn of the danger. Uh, they did nothing to mitigate the danger. I mean, it shows how much how much disregard I think they have for the safety of the Lebanese people, whether or not this ammonium nitrate belonged to them. Uh, but in terms of you know them like something actually uh, a chain of possession tying uh, the ammonium nitrate at Beirut port to Hezbollah. Uh, most we found circumstantial, not even circumstantial evidence. Uh, so there is nothing that says that this is their ammonium nitrate. Um, the, it's a big issue for them now, uh, right? They're trying to um, force the investigation into the ammonium nitrate to be stopped. I think uh, uh, just just earlier today, uh, it was halted for the third time, if I'm not mistaken, and they've launched a propaganda campaign against Judge Tara Ubitar, who's conducting the investigation into this, accusing him of being a uh, a, a, a United States plant and working on behalf of the United States. There's that narrative we talked about again that uh, you know the United States is trying to use uh, its, its influence to, to influence Lebanese politics, but they've said why they 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 oppose him. This right, it, it is it was their allies at various points who were in charge of various uh, responsibilities when it comes to, uh, to 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 the Beirut port. Um, if this investigation fingers them, if it, if it points to their responsibility, um, this will harm their credibility in the upcoming Lebanese parliamentary elections. And if Hezbollah's allies are weakened, uh, Hezbollah's clout in the Lebanese government is commensurately weakened. So I think that's where Hezbollah's main concern, rather than um, anything indicating that they themselves were storing the, the ammonium nitrate in that in, in the port. Yeah, I'd like to go back to Mitch, though, and uh, talk about the United States. Yuani is based in New York. You were uh, you were working, as we said, in the, the New York Police Department, dealing with these sort of issues. Could you explain uh, what, you, in, what you, about Hezbollah's, what you saw, what you see as what is Hezbollah doing here? Well, are there, do you think Hezbollah sleeper cells? What did we think they've done in the past? What are we concerned about going forward here, here in the United States? Sure, Mike. You know, in New York, we've always been concerned uh, about the Hezbollah uh, slash Iran threat. And for a number of reasons, you know, one being the fact that the uh, Iranian mission to the UN was here. So one of the few Iranian governmental entities within the United States, which if you go back to 92 and 1994 in Argentina, was a venue through which those plots uh, were to some degree coordinated. Um, beyond that, in New York City, uh, we've also got a significant diaspora population uh, from southern Lebanon, from many of the stronghold towns uh, where, Le where Lebanese Hezbollah uh, originates from. And there's a lot of travel, you know, back and forth uh, between those towns. Uh, as part of our concern, you know, when I was at NYPD, we sent a team down to Argentina to the tri-border area uh, to learn from the Argentinians uh, about 1992 and 1994 um, and those attacks in uh, Buenos Aires. But more specifically, you know, in the last few years, um, there have actually been the arrest of a number of Islamic Jihad organization, IJO or Unit 910 operatives, which is sort of their external operations arm. And it's something that, you know, I know Matt has written a lot about as well. And uh, as, you know, the former NYPD commissioner noted that they conducted pre-operational surveillance. It's one of the hallmarks of Hezbollah for future attacks. And it was, quote unquote, in support of anticipated IGO terrorist attacks here in New York. Um, so what were they doing? They were gathering intelligence. They were conducting surveillance. 
They were using plausible diplomatic business and educational covers for their operational activities. They were even preparing human target packages to potentially assassinate adversaries. Um, they used sophisticated counterintelligence tradecraft and operational security. And a lot of these operatives had dual nationalities traveling on Western passports, uh, taking advantage of this uh, spread out Shia diaspora. Uh, but to put a fine point on it, what were they doing surveillance on? If you know New York City, the Port Authority bus terminal, the Grand Central, uh, you know, Grand, Grand Central Station, New York Stock Exchange, FBI headquarters, as well as JFK Airport, among others. And by the way, it wasn't only a New York City focus. Uh, you know, Quincy Market, Fenway Park, and the Prudential Center in Boston, as well as the Capitol Building and the White House itself. So this is some significant operational planning and not that different in a sense from what we're talking about in Europe, although we haven't seen anything as brazen as actually trying to store ammonium nitrate here in the United States. And would you, um, uh, Mitch, just a follow up on that, and, and would you think the purpose is to, that they, uh, these cells might uh, carry out attacks, as Alexander mentioned, in Europe, if the United States has a major conflict with Iran, or what do you think they're preparing for? Sure. Well, listen, you know, from conversations with my former colleagues at, at NYPD, you know, in January 2020, um, you know, we were sort of at, at DEFCON 5 at NYPD in the wake of the elimination of uh, Soleimani. And in fact, you know, the IRGC Quds Force Commander Ghani, as well as the Hezbollah Secretary General Nasrallah, have threatened retaliation for Qasem Soleimani. And sure, you know, now we're almost in 2022. Um, it seems like it's been some time. But remember, um, you know, even when uh, Imad Mugnia was taken off the battlefield in 2008, it took four years of attempts. Uh, by Hezbollah and Iran before they finally were successful in an attack in Bulgaria, uh, killing Israeli tourists. So, you know, we have to believe that the intent for some type of retaliation for the elimination of Soleimani is still on the books. When and where and how remains to be done. Um, but, you know, certainly in New York City, it's something that's uh, not been forgotten. Matt, I'd like to bring you in on this. It's obviously you've done a a lot of work on these sort of issues, as Mitch uh, re referenced, and also if you could address their uh, the their financial activities themselves. So the cards on the table. I was the government's expert witness in the one of these cases that's gone to trial in the Southern District. And uh, just to underscore what Mitch said, um, there was real there was real operational planning here. Um, now it doesn't mean that they were going to be carrying out an attack tomorrow or next month or whatever it was, but. When asked, uh, the uh, individual since convicted said that he believed that he was sent to be part of um, a, a sleeper cell, his word, not mine, I actually don't like the term, but he used it, uh, and that the conditions under which he expected he and others would be asked to actually act on these capabilities would be if the United States took significant action against Iran or Hezbollah. And I would argue that taking out Qasem Soleimani is pretty significant action. Um, and, uh, and that's something we just need to be aware of. Uh, the good news is that both local authorities, in this case, NYPD and, and, and the feds, the FBI, seem to be pretty on top of these cases. Um, but it really is telling that Hezbollah, Iran too, but we're talking about Hezbollah here in particular, is willing and brazen enough and in some ways has the operational skills to be active even in places with really significant uh, law enforcement and intelligence capabilities. I think there's this misnomer out there that groups tend to be active only in countries that are uh, maybe have more lax security or, or, or weaker um, border controls. We've seen Hezbollah being engaged in places like Bulgaria and Cyprus and South America, but we've also seen them being engaged in activities, as Mitch said, in, in the UK, uh, as Alexander said, in Germany. Um, when the Germans did this designation, they pointed to significant operational activities over the last few years uh, in Germany as well and, and here in the United States. And so we, we, we look at this and we, we, um, we realize the need for vigilance. So let me just ask you, and I, I do want to go to Alexander about uh, Germany and so on, but let me just ask you, um, follow up, Matt, on, you know, I think for most, I mean, I, I get a sense just from, you know, if you read the newspapers, you don't hear about Hezbollah as much you know obviously al-qaeda isis and for good reason over the years 
but I, I don't find that at least the the media at least is uh, focuses much on this. I'm curious how you or Mitch, who have been working on this for U.S. force uh, services, have you? Uh, why that you think that is, but it seems like at least officials are at least very focused on it. I'm curious. Look, I'll just say that, you know, that, that, that statement hurts. You're talking to a panel of people who write a book has all the time. But <laughs> that hurts. Um, no, I, I do think that the people who follow this uh, watch it and write about it carefully. And there are articles about it from time to time. I, I don't, I don't uh, have issue with the fact that the Islamic State and Al Qaeda in Afghanistan are what's what's top of the news. But you will find that if you pay attention, there is stuff happening around the world on a regular basis. Whether it is illicit finance through um, money laundering related to the international narcotics industry, whether it's providing technical support regarding uh, missile systems to the Houthis in Yemen whether it's working hand in glove with the Quds Force on illicit oil sales to fund the Quds Force, Hezbollah and Hamas, whether it's providing funding to Palestinian terrorist groups or the various types of international activities we've discussed, including the ammonium nitrate plots. There's a lot that's going on on a regular basis. By the way, there's still a lot of stuff we started with in Lebanon. But the world's a busy place and there's not as much oxygen in the room for any one thing. But I actually think this gets a decent amount of attention. Okay, well, that's good. Then do you find me? Oh, if I, if I, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just commenting. I just want, in addition to uh, their reaction or their retaliation for Qasem Soleimani's uh, uh, assassination, in some ways it's already ongoing. If we looked at their statements, at least Hezbollah's statements subsequent to the assassination, they said the ultimate revenge for Qasem Soleimani's death would be to eject the United States uh, entirely from the region. Forces. Uh, you know, Al-Akhbar had an article on how every manifestation of American presence from the scientist, the human rights worker, is a manifestation of this American occupation. So in the, Hezbollah may not have carried out an attack like the one in Burgas in 2012 to retaliate for, um, for Ahmad Mughniya's assassination, but they are employing softer methods right now. And that, I think they're operating within the constraints that Lebanon's collapse places on them. In the sense that if they were to assassinate an American official or the equivalent of Qasem Soleimani, that could invite U.S. sanctions on Lebanon, that could invite military retaliation, something of the sort that could push Lebanon over the edge where right now there is no recovery. Uh, there is no donor conference waiting at the end of the war to come rebuild Lebanon. And there is, Iran is cash strapped that it can't carry that burden. But they are, I mean, if we look at Iraq, uh, we've been seeing near constant Katusha missile attacks on, on the green or on, on U.S. bases. This is trying to recreate, in my mind, what happened in South Lebanon between 1985 and 2000, this constant harassment against American forces, intending to demoralize them, intending to, to keep them on edge and eventually uh, witness their or push them out. In Lebanon, we've seen this propaganda campaign uh, using this softer method to say, to, to weaken American influence, uh, any American aid that may come in to kind of cast suspicion upon it so that the United States can't carry a foothold and counter Hezbollah. So I think the, the retaliation is in some ways ongoing. Let me go to Alexander. Uh, and uh, how did you discuss how uh, Germany and other European countries have uh, addressed the Hezbollah threats there? Hmm. Well, that's kind of a curious case, I guess, because mostly it was not addressed. So uh, just until recently, only the UK, when it was still a member of the EU, and the Netherlands had been designating the whole of Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. And then there were a couple of countries who were separating Hezbollah artificially in a social, political and a military wing. Uh, with the argument that Hezbollah is a political actor and the, that you need to be able to talk to political actors in Lebanon. Um, so they banned the military operations, the foreign operation, everything that Mitch and Matt talked about. So th this was the, the approach for a long time. Um, and then recently there was a shift so that maybe there are some good news because so far we haven't discussed or heard a lot of good news in this context. So Germany, for reasons that are unclear, but I have a, a theory, of course, moved from saying we have to keep the door open to Hezbollah's political wing to no, we're going to ban all operations of Hezbollah in Germany. We're going to raid their mosques and associations. And we're going to go after them from now on. Now, of course, this is 
the effectiveness can be discussed, but there was no event that caused that. It was the same government that for 16 years, Angela Merkel's governments said, well, no, we're going to continue talking to them. But then there was a, there's a shift going on, I guess, in, in Europe and specifically in Germany and potentially also in France. And that's a, that would be a game changer. Now, if Germany and France would move, adjust their strategy after decades saying we have to talk to them uh, by saying, no, we designate them as a total a terrorist organization. This would limit their capacity to do everything that we discussed, Mitch and I, earlier. Uh, this would lead to raids and interruptions. They would confiscation of valuable items, of property, of all of that. So there are some good news here um, that might be coming up. And I'm highlighting this because I've been working on Hezbollah for 20 years, 15 years involved in advocating them to be banned because of their operations also in Europe. And there was a time when donations to Hezbollah charities were tax deductible in Germany, meaning that actually the German government was subsidizing Hezbollah in an indirect way. So we published a reports about this, which led to bans and confiscation of money. So there is a slow process of moving into the right direction. And I think it's worth sharing this. And last point. Uh, please, uh, everyone here in the call, everyone who's engaged here, let's talk to our friends in France. In France, Macron said Hezbollah cannot be an army fighting Israel, a militia fighting the civil population in, uh, in Syria, and a, a, a decent political player in Lebanon. And this is a basically new assessment that that's not possible. To say that that's not possible, what Hezbollah says it is and what they're actually doing. So let's focus on this policy work, helping France move into the right direction. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Alexander, because I was going to add that was my follow up on France, because given the French uh, historic ties to Syria and uh, and Lebanon, uh, what are the French uh, doing or not doing? I mean, you said that you yeah. want to push them. So maybe you just give a little more granularity to that. Right. I, I mean, I don't think the French can be pushed uh, in that, you know, explicit way. There's there's been a, a change in the narrative. So the dominant narrative was we have to keep the doors open to talk to Hezbollah through this artificial separation. And Hassan Nasrallah, Hassan Nasrallah was actually making jokes about this, saying, yeah, yeah, in the morning we do the social work and in the afternoon we do the military stuff, right? So this was purely made up by Europeans to keep that diplomatic channel open. And the shift towards saying, well, this is no longer viable might be a result of a simple assessment of the strategy strategy that has been applied for decades. Has Hezbollah adjusted its activities? Has it demilitarized? Has it become less hostile? Has it become any less problematic? And I guess the assessment would be no. So an adjustment of the strategy would be the logical next step. And there are the party of uh, Monsieur the President Macron and others are open to discussing things and are open to advice and influence, I guess, and discussions that which they weren't and the predecessors weren't just a few years ago. So this is the good news. We need to, and if Germany, Germany has done this, if the French join, the whole of the EU, the European Union might at some point put all of Hezbollah on the terrorist list, and that might have some effect then on the region as well. Yeah. I just like one follow. What do you see as the resistance on the French side on that, on being not emulating the Germans so far? Would you say? Well, I, I would like to focus on the positive points because so far the French have been hardcore. This is not going to happen. So I'm actually positively surprised. You know, after a decade and a half of. Uh, hundreds of briefings and uh, dozens of reports and everyone here trying to make the case. This shift in policy, I'm not sure that there's a causation that our work had an impact, but I of course like to think that. But so I would like to focus that we just should uh, support those who are reconsidering their position towards Hezbollah and Lebanon. And of course, support those who have already been outspoken and making this a priority for European security, for transatlantic security, and also for the region, the Middle East itself. Okay. Uh, let me uh, go back to the region. I want to remind folks on the, on the 
the 15 minutes rem uh, remaining. We've gotten some questions. Uh, try to bring some of them in. Uh, uh, feel free to, to send questions. Uh, let me go back to the region again, uh, a little closer uh, to Iran. I I'd like to talk about uh, Yemen. It's obviously been a, um, uh, it's been a, they've had their own civil war that the Iranians have gotten in with supporting the Houthis, the, the fighting with uh, those forces and with the Saudis, and then the UAE over the years, of course, still with the Saudis. Um, it's, it, it was one of the first issues that uh, the President Biden addressed early in this presidency this year on foreign policy. And I'd like to see, and it's something also that the Israelis, I mean, I, I know I've heard this for a while, for several years, their increasing concern about Yemen being a possible source um, as part of that ring of fire I mentioned that missiles perhaps could be launched from there. What is Hezbollah's role uh, in supporting uh, or training, you know, support of any kind with the Houthi forces uh, that are backed by the Iranians in Yemen, which is obviously also a very important strategic uh, uh, location. Um, I don't know, David or Matt, would either of you like to address that issue? Sure. Um, first of all, just to the caveat, Sam, the issue of the French, one issue that has come up is that if you look at probably the last dozen or more big Hezbollah illicit finance cases that touch on Europe, uh, they all touch on France and or Belgium. And so the, the Francophile kind of file has become a pretty prominent one uh, when you're looking at their illicit financial uh, ongoings. And that might be one reason why uh, authorities are open to at least taking a slightly different look at it. But the issue of Yemen is really uh, a little bit complicated, actually, because there's some people completely conflated. The Houthis are like the Yemeni Hezbollah. And within this network of pro-Iranian Shi militias, they're not all equal, they're not all the same. And the Houthis are a little bit farther down the line. There are actually things that they don't like about the Iranians, but they share certain things in common, in particular, a hatred of Israel in the United States. And so there are very, very specific examples you can point to, and that's what I recommend people do instead of this kind of big idea, you can actually see the specific cases in which Hezbollah has done very tangible things to benefit the Houthis at Iran's behest. The most significant and early on around 2012 is when Hezbollah started sending some very, very senior, very capable special forces commanders to Yemen. One in particular who was later designated by the US government is named Abu Ali Tabtabai. Tabtabai, long known to the Israelis, he was for many years stationed in Southern Lebanon, focused south of the Israelis, head of special forces units of Hezbollah there was picked from there and sent to Syria. So you got a sense already that they were taking Syria pretty seriously even early on because they were moving key people with key capabilities from key places away from Israel towards Syria. But while others stayed, they fairly quickly took Abu Ali Tabtabai and reassigned him again to Yemen. And so when they start moving key personnel to help the Houthis, that's a little bit of an alarm. Then in 2013, Yemeni security forces interdicted uh, an Iranian vessel, the Jahan 1, off the coast of Yemen and arrested eight Yemenis and two Lebanese Hezbollah operatives uh, believed to be heading to Houthi territory with a ship carrying uh, tons of Iranian weapons and explosives. So again, you get tangible example, Hezbollah operatives being captured, uh, uh, smuggling these weapons. Uh, in another case, U.S. authorities determined Hezbollah weapons procurement officer was sourcing IED components in China planned for the weapons to be sent to the Houthis in Yemen. And there are many other cases as we go down the years so that you can see Iran kind of directing elements, different elements of its larger Shia network. Who has needs? Who has capabilities? Oh, wait, you need IED components? Hezbollah's got a guy they can procure from in China. Let's get some. Treasury designated this. They declassified the information about how this was Hezbollah procuring in China to benefit the Houthis. And you see Hezbollah doing similar types of things in Iraq, training some Bahraini Shia militants, et cetera. Um, even, for example, uh, some very tangible things recently involving Palestinian groups. The PFLP has been in the news because the Israelis designated some NGOs. Some of the employees of those NGOs either went to Lebanon for training from Hezbollah or were about to. 
So we're talking about Hezbollah training for the PFLP, not even Hamas or Islamic Jihad. So you see Hezbollah playing a, a kind of uh, a role of, of how can I help further the joint mission uh, for other groups to play their part. And Yemen's a good example of that. Good. Uh, if I may add, uh, yeah, just uh, one thing. One thing that uh, Matt had mentioned earlier was, you know, this this kind of sense of togetherness that the uh, the war in Syria had built between uh, between Hezbollah and these different resistance axis factions. And while I agree, you know, the Houthis are not exactly what Hezbollah is to Iran. They're closer, maybe to something like Hamas or Palestinian Islamic Jihad. One thing we've tried, we've also seen beyond the military actions, is kind of a um, a linking of the hearts and minds between. The Houthis and you know their Yemeni supporters and and Hezbollah, um, the Yemeni uh, or sorry the main uh, Houthi radio station I think it's called Sam ninety three FM uh, conducted a uh, a fundraising campaign for Lebanon uh, for Hezbollah uh, I think it was about a year or two ago. Um, you see uh, the, the Houthis promising to send fighters to Lebanon uh, to you know in the case of an Israeli invasion, in the case of a future war with Israel, um, you know when when Nasrallah. Uh, recently declared that any assault on, on Jerusalem by the Israelis would lead to a regional war. The Houthis were some of the first people to come out and say, yes, we are totally on board with this. And they've repeated this repeat, you know, since. So there is an effort, it seems like, to coordinate um, their propaganda, to coordinate their messaging, uh, and to kind of create a, a, a hearts and minds bond between uh, the two groups. So while they are not you know, exactly the same in relation to Iran, uh, they're increasingly interlinking their activities and their messaging. That remind, let me bring up, um, uh, that uh, leads me to another question. Um, you know, during the, uh, at the, the Trump administration where they were tightening up sanctions, you mentioned David, maybe about it is uh, the fundraising element. You heard about this where Hezbollah was short of cash, you know, or they had a hunt of uh, their billboards. Uh, there were things about them trying to get uh, raise more money. Now, since then, you have in 2021, you have a new U.S. administration is not enforcing a lot of the uh, sanctions against Iran and oil prices have, have gone up significantly. Uh, and Iran is, you know, obviously is selling more oil and is getting more money for its oil. How has that affected uh, Hezbollah financing. Um, well, let me first. Yeah, please. Let me let me first comment on on, on the, uh, the. I think the uh, impact of our old of our sanctions under the Trump administration were a little bit exaggerated, um, in the sense that uh, you know this this annual campaign. First of all, they have about five annual campaigns they conduct for fundraising. They have different fundraising streams, and this is just on the charitable end. One thing they do almost every year is called uh, campaign Tajhiz Mujahid, right? Uh, uh, equip a fighter, equip a mujahid, and you know this has been going on for for years. Um, they also have different funding streams that don't come from Iran. Uh, you know, a, a lot of what's been focused on is the illicit finance. But what about these? You know, the otherwise illicit finance, in the sense of Hezbollah runs gas stations in Lebanon. They have uh, a pharmaceutical chain. They have clothing stores. Um, you know, you might have uh, remittances from expatriates in in West Africa and in South America. Um, that are going through streams that are perhaps untraceable, either through cash transfers. Uh, and so we don't really have Hezbollah's ledgers open to say, well, are they really suffering? The appeal that Nasrallah had made, I think a big deal was made out of it. And it wasn't the first time he had appealed in, in that way. Um, now, like I said, the, the sanctions uh, kind of tighten the screws a little bit, of course. Um, our, our approach to, to our, the, the Biden administration's approach, I think, rather than open the funding streams necessarily, um, has given Hezbollah more breathing room. One thing we've seen, especially in the messaging we've sent, uh, you know, whether if you look at, um, say, Lukman Slim's assassination, right? This was a Lebanese Shia activist um, who was assassinated under or killed under mysterious conditions, highly, you know, heavily implicating Hezbollah. Um, he was an anti-Hezbollah activist. In subsequent statements, either from State Department or from Ambassador Dorothy Shea in Lebanon, no mention of his anti-Hezbollah activity was ever made. And I think this sends a significant message that, you know, we are, I understand that perhaps, you know, the United States doesn't want to jump the gun and implicate Hezbollah where criminality hasn't been found, decisive criminality hasn't been found. But to not even mention this man's life work, um, I think sends a message that we are trying to ease up off of Hezbollah as the spearhead of Iranian regional activity and sends a message to Iran that perhaps we are um, willing to respect its, 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 its prerogatives in the region. Uh, so I think that's where the, the focus should be rather than the money per se. How much 
have we indicated that Iran and its proxies have a little bit more leeway to act and that we are not going to pursue them in the same way? And I think we saw this also when um, the, the Hezbollah um, had promised to bring in the ships into Lebanon, right? Sanctioned Iranian oil being brought in by a designated terrorist organization. And uh, our response was that, you know, we, Lebanon can do what it wants. No one's going to fall on their sword if someone's going to bring in fuel for hospitals. So I think that messaging is what's really important. I think it's a very good point, David. And I think this is in the five minutes we have remaining. I'd like to end with this issue, if I could, for everyone to join in. Um, uh, and by the way, I agree with you. I thought that the uh, reports I would hear, even from some officials, uh, that Hezbollah has been weakened more because of the sanctions. I also thought they were exaggerated. Um, do you think, uh, when I say you, I mean, everyone, anyone in the panel, I'd like you to jump in. Um, do you, is there a sense, despite the, the reach of Hezbollah, let's just focus, you know, in the region or elsewhere, uh, that, you know, they're so involved in a lot of nefarious activities. Um, but is there a, do you have any sense of overreach at all? Uh, certainly in the region, in the Middle East. And I guess a couple with that, I'd like to address just what David just brought up, is what, what could the United States do more to, um, to uh, reduce Hezbollah's influence and, 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 and reach? And I don't know, maybe Matt, I'll start with you on that since. So look, I do think, as we said earlier, Hezbollah is not fully in the ropes, but it's in a little bit of a bind. Uh, you see the Gulf states and the Arab world in general distancing itself from Hezbollah. You, know, you may remember after the 2006 war, many in the Arab and Muslim worlds were lauding Hassan Nasrallah, who kind of successfully stuck his finger in Israel's eye. It's a totally different ball game now. Uh, Gulf states are um, withdrawing their ambassadors, uh, last week and telling their citizens to leave Lebanon. It's a lot of pressure. Um, and I think that the, the balance is here that everyone is concerned about further instability in Lebanon. It's not a new issue. In fact, it's one of the primary issues that France and others have pointed to in the past for why they didn't want to take more action. But right now, there's no question, Lebanon is at an incredibly delicate, unstable, politically, and maybe even more so economically unstable situation. A big chunk of that falls at Hezbollah's feet, but by no means all of it. Hezbollah is part of the corrupt leadership, but it's not all of it. And so what people are trying to figure out right now is how to play this chess game. What can be done that will put pressure on Hezbollah to stop its uh, illicit, malign, militant activities? Uh, and what can pressure can be put on people, Hezbollah and others, to begin to agree to some of the political reforms that are necessary? The people involved don't want to make those political reforms because it would undermine their ability to milk this regime through their corrupt leadership. That includes Hezbollah. And so we're at a little bit of a standstill. So I expect you're going to see things at the margin. It doesn't surprise me that we didn't stop ships from Iran going to Lebanon with oil in the midst of a crisis. It actually didn't alleviate anything. There were still long, long lines. You want to do that? Go do that. But I do think you're going to see an increase in covert activity. I think that there are it hasn't been enough financial activity, certainly not to bankrupt Hezbollah or Iran, but there's been enough to make it very, very difficult for them. And so I think we're going to see a lot more of that. And frankly, it's not going to be very satisfying. That's the nature of the, this complicated situation we find ourselves in. Uh, sorry, I, was, I muted myself. Uh, we have two more minutes. Does anyone want else jump in about what they think either the U.S. or our European allies should be doing uh, to, uh, to confront this? Maybe yeah. I can quickly, quickly say that I would have liked to say what Matthew was just saying, especially the part about uh, Nasrallah from, I think, being the most popular leader in the Arab world in 2006 to maybe the, one of the opposites uh, right now. And I'm not sure if this is being exploited or worked with properly. I actually don't know, but I think this is a dramatic uh, change. And then on the other hand, uh, Hezbollah seems to care a lot about how the Europeans see them, though Hezbollah has 
especially Nasrallah has said, we promise we are not active in Germany. We promise, I swear, I'm not lying. We don't do anything in Germany. So th that kind of statement is quite interesting. And also they said that Germany was bowing under the pressure of the United States to when they were banning Hezbollah as a complete group. And of course, that is, uh, I mean, I don't think that that's true because the pressure from the US was on for decades. And the same government at some point just shifted gear here. So there might be some activity from uh, Europe coming that is helpful. Um, at least uh, Hezbollah seems to be somewhat concerned. And Mitch, would you like to end this, please? Yeah, sure. Now, I think, uh, you know, going back to a topic we were discussing a little bit earlier, you know, why is Hezbollah maybe comparatively a little bit less in the media? I think it goes to the nature of the organization. This is a very sophisticated um, operation. They're not looking to recruit uh, 18 and 20 year olds who get radicalized online in Europe or the United States. They're looking for people who, who's, who they can trace back to towns in Lebanon, um, you know, Ayat al Shab and others where they know their lineage and know, know they can be trusted. Um, but make no mistake, just because their activities are below the waterline and don't necessarily make the mass media uh, doesn't mean that they're not active, doesn't mean that they're not conducting their sort of pre-operational activities um, so that they have this option. They want to have this optionality to respond in Europe and the U.S. Uh, worldwide to events as tensions between U.S. and Iran, uh, you know, continue to potentially escalate. So I think, uh, you know, for all those reasons and others, um, this is an important group, Lebanese Hezbollah, that we need to keep our eyes on. Okay. Well, look, uh, we've run out of time. Thank you very much, all the panelists for joining. I appreciate uh, the viewers for uh, for watching this. And I want to thank you, Wani, for organizing this session and really an excellent day of, uh, of conference. So thank you very much.